Good evening, everyone. We are now live, and we will begin our program. I ask that you all please stand for opening prayer. Thank you so much. Please bow your heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for, some, for the opportunity of fellowship and, and coming together yet again to learn education and words that you've given us. Lord, we pray that we will take these to heart and, and that this will be something that will, will, will be life-saving, life-transforming. Be with our speaker, Lord, as he lays words that you've given him this day. These things we ask you only on. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone had a good lunch. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, one, one little, little point, point, but it's just, uh, just uh, I'm, I'm saying this facetiously, folks. I, I like to tease, too. I, I was I explaining to, to someone at my table that I have a I have theory, theory about, about suits. Suit. I've gotten the, all the people at my church I attend in Boston to buy into it. The purpose of soup is to accompany dumplings. So there's no point to have soup without dumplings. So at my church, when they're doing any dinner stuff, they do a special bowl for Brother Williams that has extra dumplings with the soup. But anyway, it's just, for the next time I come to Ipsy. <laughs> okay, um, how you can cure blood pressure in six weeks. This is the topic today, and what I'm gonna review with you are strategies to lower blood pressure that has been shown in scientific studies to be effective as medication. I'm not suggesting anyone take, stop taking medication, get off of medication when your doctor tells you, but, but show him or her the progress you're making. So let's begin by the basics. What is blood pressure? Your body has a pump called your heart and it pushes blood through your blood vessels providing every part of your body with the oxygen uh, you need in order to survive. Blood pressure is a measure of the force existing against the blood vessels as the heart pumps blood through your body. So everybody has blood pressure. The question is, is your pressure too high, okay? When the heart squeezes and pushes blood into the vessels, the blood pressure goes up. It goes down when the heart relaxes. And that's why in a minute I'll tell you, you have an upper number and a lower number. Um, the blood pressure readings have two numbers, which are red, one number over the other, like 110 over 70, for example. The top number of your reading is called a systolic blood pressure. It tells you the force of the blood against the artery walls when your heart beats. So when your heart pumps and pushes the blood out, that's the top number. The bottom number is called a diastolic blood pressure. It tells you what your blood pressure is when your heart relaxes between heartbeats. The blood pressure number is particularly significant because it's capturing the minimum amount of pressure that's always there uh, within your blood vessels. Blood pressure changes from minute to minute, so it's normal for blood pressure to, be, to change. It's affected by activity, by rest, by how you're feeling. Um, everyone's blood pressure goes up in situations of anger, pain, fear, or high stress. Your blood pressure probably rises when you have a shouting match with somebody, when you're given a speech, when you're interviewing for a new job. Your blood pressure also varies over the course of the day. It is usually lower when you are getting rest or asleep. So just realize that's the nature of blood pressure. So what is hypertension? High blood pressure or hypertension is when the force of the blood pushing on the blood vessel walls is too great. If your blood pressure is too high, it means your heart has to pump harder and the force of the blood flowing through your vessels is too high. This puts your arteries, the vessels that carry the blood, under greater pressure and strain this can cause your arteries to thicken or harden or to become weaker. After a while, high blood pressure can damage your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your eyes, among other organs, but those are some common ones. Having high blood pressure means that your blood pressure is consistently elevated above the normal range. What high blood pressure is not? High blood pressure does not mean that you are super tense. 
even the calmest, most laid back, relaxed person can have high blood pressure. So it doesn't have to do with, with being tense. To know whether you have it or not, you need to have your blood pressure checked regularly, ideally as part of a regular checkup. Our normal blood pressure readings can range from normal to severely elevated. Experiencing one elevated reading doesn't mean you have hypertension, especially if there was some anxiety producing or stress producing event that occurred. The challenge of hypertension, having hypertension increases your risk for stroke, for heart attacks, for kidney disease, and many more diseases. In 2021, hypertension was a primary cause or contributing cause to almost 700,000 deaths in America. So it's a non-trivial issue. Nearly half of adults in America have hypertension. I'll show you data in a minute. Only about one in four adults have their blood pressure under control. So among those with hypertension, few people, almost half of adults with uncontrolled hypertension have stage two hypertension which means it's really at the higher level, the more elevated level. So what do we call high? This is the revised blood pressure categories. This is the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association established new guidelines in 2017, and they are stricter than they were before in terms of what is, <clears throat> is normal and what's high. So normal blood pressure now, according to these official 2017 uh, guidelines is systolic, the top number less than 120, and diastolic blood pressure less than 80. Um, before they used to use a 90 cutoff, but it's now less than 80 is what's regarded as normal. Um, elevated is if it is systolic, top number 120 to 129, and the diastolic greater than 80 is regarded as elevated. Um, blood pressure but still in the blood pressure category stage one hypertension so we're talking hypertension is high blood pressure is if your systolic number the top number is more than 130 or between 130 and 139 is one is one more than 130 is hypertension but 130 to 139 is what it calls stage one hypertension as 80 to 89 um some some they used to use a term of normally high in a high normal range and and something like that but they're now using stage one and stage two and stage two is greater than 140 for the top number systolic and greater than 90 for the bottom number any it's clear to everybody these are the official latest medical definitions of high blood pressure and the blood pressure categories that are used today. This is uh, national data for the US 2070 to 2020. 56% of all black adults, so that's more than one in two, have high blood pressure. 48% of whites, 46% of Asians, 39% of Hispanics. So this is a very, very common problem. Of, this is the percentage of persons who are on prescribed medications who have it under control. The highest number is 32% of whites. That's one in three. Among African Americans, one in four of people who have hypertension, are on meds, have it controlled. Control means that it's in the normal range. Well, Asians is 19%, Latinos 25%. So, Keeping blood pressure nice and normal is, is one thing, then if you have hypertension, to get it under control is another. I just want to make the point that hypertension costs a lot. Even at a local level, individual persons with hypertension have, on average in America, 2,000 higher annual healthcare costs, 2.5 times the inpatient costs, almost double the outpatient costs, nearly triple the prescription medication costs. High blood pressure costs the U.S. economy $131 billion a year. So it's a common problem that's consequential. Okay, the solution, the DASH diet. DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Um, it was a study done uh, by, I'll show you his name in a minute, uh, that led the team, a researcher at the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, a Harvard affiliated hospital. This is a diet that is recommended by the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. It's a diet that lowers blood pressure as much as drug treatment, regardless of one's age, sex, weight, or race. And when you cut salt intake as well, the DASH diet is more effective than blood pressure medications in controlling your blood pressure. 
Here is Dr. Frank Sachs. He led the team of researchers that did the study. And this is what he says, it's intriguing. The idea of the DASH diet was to look at the diets of vegetarians and other people around the world with low blood pressure and create a similar diet. So that gives you a clue to the diet right there. If they study populations around the world in United States and in all Western countries, blood pressure increases with age. The older you get, the more your blood pressure goes up. In many traditional societies, blood pressure does not increase with age. So the increases with age is not inevitable. It's what happens in our modern industrialized societies, but other places didn't. Um, the foods we found in populations low in blood pressure were primarily fruits, vegetables, fish, nuts, and whole grains. They ate very little meat, sugar-containing beverages, and desserts. So it gives you a clue to where they're going, because that's what has been shown. Not, not these were not studies, but just looking at stud, looking at normal populations which have not been touched by civilization, who have low blood pressure, and blood pressure does not increase with age. This is the diets they have found. So the trick was, can they create a diet like that for the average American? So this is the DASH diet. Whole grains, vegetables, legumes, peas and beans, fruit. You do allow fish, but not, I'll show you in a minute how much. It's not very much. Low fat dairy food, limited fats and oils, few sweets, very little red meat, sugar-containing beverages, and desserts. I'm going to go into all of this in more detail so that you get a good handle on it. Uh, this is the Dash and Omni Heart. The, the Omni Heart is a version of the Dash uh, that, so it's, it's essentially the same thing. It's the same team, uh, but the latest study. Um, uh, so look what individuals can have on the Dash and Omni Heart diet. Whole grains, four servings a day. And a serving is a slice of bread or a half cup of cereal, or pasta or rice. But note, it's whole grains. So this is not white bread. This is not white pasta. This is whole wheat pasta. Um, so it's whole grains. Legumes and nuts, two servings a day, quarter cup of nuts, so half cup of cooked beans, uh, four ounces of tofu is examples. Low fat dairy, emphasize low fat. I'm gonna talk about fat in depth in a minute. Oils and fats, this is really important because oils and fats are significant contributors. The oils and fats are two servings a day. That's a little bit compared to how we eat because a, one serving is a tablespoon of oil. Madrin or mayonnaise is one serving. And this is not capturing just what you add at the table. This is capturing what you have used in cooking. Okay, so the typical person cooking uses more than one tablespoon of oil. And you only have two servings a day. Ta tablespoon of oil, margarine, or mayonnaise. 11 servings of fruits and vegetables. 11 servings of fruits and vegetables. And given the examples of what a serving is. Uh, fish, poultry, quarter cup cooked. So a quarter cup a fish is what they allow, which is not much, a quarter cup. Dessert, two servings a day, but a, a, is a teaspoon of sugar is one of the servings. So if you put a teaspoon in your tea or something, that's a serving of sugar or dessert and or one small cookie. So really what your diet really is, is a diet heavily of fruits and vegetables, foods as they naturally come from nature, and whole grains and legumes and nuts, because the low-fat dairy is just two servings, not very much. Note that a serving of low-fat dairy is half a cup of milk. A cup is eight ounces. So do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's, you are really eating a diet heavily of whole grains, legumes and nuts, and vegetables. And that's the way foods naturally came from nature. And I'm gonna show you in a minute in detail. So this is the same information, just presented in a different way so you can see it. 11 servings of fruits 
and vegetables a day. That is a lot more fruits and vegetables we need, but I can tell you the benefits of that does not only, if you do this, you're not just reducing hypertension, you're reducing your risk of cancer, you're reducing your risk of, of, of cardiovascular disease of a broad range of conditions, whole grains, remember? Um, it's whole grains, um, not grains, but whole grains, because you get the, with the whole grains, you get in the fiber. Um, uh, low fat dairy, this is the same thing, showing you it's a cup of milk or yogurt, one and a half ounce cheese, beans, nuts, uh, fish, poultry, quarter cup. Okay, uh, these are servings, fats and oils. I kind of went over that already. Um, this is the Omni Heart. This, they just threw this in, it's not necessary, but they just to make people feel that they can really do this. They throw in what they call a wild card. So you can say you can have one serving a day of like one exercise of bread or one um, 20 calories worth of fish or poultry, whole grains. So basically this is not necessary, but they threw it in so that people feel they can splurge a little bit. So it's okay. Um, this is the data um, from one of the studies done with it. This is in six weeks. There's a 15 point reduction in blood pressure uh, for someone on the DASH diet with also a, a low sodium, um, a 15 point reduction in six weeks. If your doctor gets you to have a 15 point reduction in your blood pressure in six weeks, that is amazing. And this is the findings from a study, New England Journal of Medicine, the top one of the top two medical journals in the country. So these are well published, these are well documented scientific facts. That's why the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association supports this. Um, this is showing you um, the actual changes over time in from one of the studies. Um, this is the blood pressure changes in six weeks, a systolic blood pressure down eight points overall. For persons at stage one hypertension, it was down 13 points on average. For persons with prehypertension, it was down seven points. So you could just see the difference. Overall, four points, but with stage one hypertension, six points, prehypertension, four points. And look, the reductions in, um, uh, this is shown for persons whose cholesterol overall was 12 points, but those whose cholesterol was high, 20 points reduction. So just showing you this thing is really working and across multiple subgroups. Let me talk a little bit about the importance of fruits and vegetables and why it is so important um, and why it is so effective in reducing blood pressure. And that's why you see the diet is heavily fruits and vegetables. The secret of the sodium potassium ratio. This is the way to think of it. There's a civil war taking place at the level of every cell of your body. And there's a war is between sodium and potassium. When sodium is winning, the cells retain water, which pushes your blood pressure up. When potassium is winning, so when there's more sodium than potassium, that's what happens. When there's more potassium than sodium, the body gets rid of sodium and water, and this reduces blood pressure. So what you want to keep blood pressure nice and low is to have more potassium than sodium in your body, in your diet. And do you know what? Every food that God has created has more potassium than sodium. But I'm going to show you what happens when we refine the food. Food processing and preservation reduces potassium and dramatically increases sodium. In their natural form, all fruits and vegetables are low sodium foods. Naturally, they have more potassium than sodium. They have a higher K sodium to potassium ratio that keeps blood pressure low. Once foods are changed to other forms, sodium is dramatically increased, potassium is decreased, the reversal of the sodium potassium ratio takes place. And I'm going to show you that with several examples. Look at an apple. You see 152 milligrams of potassium, one milligram of sodium. 150 to one is the ratio. A slice of apple pie. Potassium is down. Look what has happened to the so sodium. You, you see, completely reverse the ratio. So you would see the apple will keep your blood pressure nice and low. Apple pie will do the opposite. 
cabbage, 233 milligrams of potassium, 20 of sodium, 12 to 1 is a, sodium, is a potassium to sodium ratio. Sauerkraut, potassium reduced, look at its sodium increase, 747. And this is true for every food. I have some more foods to show you. Cucumber, a lot more potassium than sodium. Pickles, look what happened. Potassium is actually increased, but look at the sodium. It goes from six to 1,400. Completely changed the ratio. Kidney beans, cooked kidney beans, 340 milligrams of potassium, three milligrams of sodium. Kidney beans in a can, sodium reduced somewhat, potassium, I mean, potassium reduced somewhat, sodium dramatically increased. This is important. Everything in a can. Everything in a can has um, higher sodium. Sodium is added in pres preservation of foods. So anything in a can, there are ways we will talk about what you can do about that. One thing you can do is if you're taking beans in a can, rinse the beans off from the brine and whatever liquid they are in, that will reduce some of the sodium that has been added. Yes, question. Yeah, so, um, if you start starting with vegetables, they don't put salt in it. They don't put salt in it, do they? Good question. Very good question. Read the label. I would not make a blanket statement. In general, they are less likely to have salt added as a general rule of thumb, but read the labels, and I will show you what to look for on the labels coming right up. Yes. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of his presentation. So take notes of questions that you might have so that we can have a chance to answer as many questions as possible. Thank you. I want to give you another example with meat products, uh, fresh ground beef, more potassium than sodium, McDonald's hamburger, see a reversal of the process. Reduction in potassium, dramatic increase in sodium. Tuna, low fat, low salt tuna in water, that's a low salt can, a lot more potassium um, than sodium. But look at a regular can of tuna, dramatic increase in sodium compared to the, the tuna in water. Okay, so you, you get the point. It's it's Foods, as they naturally come from nature, will guarantee you low blood pressure for the rest of your life. But the processing of food dramatically changes. it. And I'm going to talk about what fat does and show you how we eat and the addition of fat. Uh, food sources of potassium. So I've just shown you some examples of foods. But basically, as foods naturally come from nature, they're all relatively high in potassium. Um, I have a handout here, I think. Um, most sodium, where does sodium come from in our diet? Which the, yes, the, this one, the salty six, the salty six handout. This is, where do we get sodium in our diet? This is very, very important. Note that only 6% of the salt in our diet comes from the salt we add at the table. 12% is naturally occurring. Six, 5% is what we add in cooking. 77% of the salt in our diet comes from processed and restaurant foods. Okay? Um, and what you have being handed out is the salty six. These are the six foods that contribute the most sodium in Americans' diets. And it has strategies of what you can do to lower the risk. Bread and rolls, cold cuts, and chilled meats, pizza, poultry, soup, sandwiches. Those are the six biggest contributors to sodium in the diet. Now, so the question is, can you still eat some of these foods and do them in a different way that you minimize the sodium content? Yes, and that's what the handout does. Tells you ways in which you can minimize um, uh, sodium. Here are the take home lessons on the sodium, uh, potassium to sodium ratio. Natural foods are changed from low sodium to high sodium. So in general, 
You want to eat as much as possible foods as they naturally come from nature before mankind has troubled with them. Natural foods have more potassium than sodium. God has created all these foods to keep our blood pressure nice and low. Food processing increases sodium. Food processing decreases potassium. Food processing reverses the, the healthy ratio that a creator created for your foods. I hope this point is very clear. How to have a healthy potassium to sodium ratio? Eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. Eat more fresh vegetables. Eat frozen vegetables without added butter or salt. Read the label to see what it has added. Limit your use of canned foods. Whenever possible, use canned vegetables that are low in sodium and have no salt added. If you have to use canned vegetables or beans, rinse them off to remove some of the sodium. So those are some key take home points of practically what you can do. Here is another key point. Take note of this. Read labels to identify food products that are lower in sodium. Look for foods with a 5% daily value. By law, this is on every package you buy in a processed food. So look at the sodium line and it tells you, so here, it doesn't tell me what product this is I've put up here, but it sees the sodium amount, 160 milligrams, and the DV daily value is 7%. And in general, Ideally, you want foods with daily values of 5% or less. And I have been looking, when I go to the supermarket, I look at different breads, even whole wheat breads. Some of them, the daily value is 10%. 10% is not, is high, but what they suggest, a food product with a daily value of 20% or more is very high in sodium, absolutely shouldn't get it. Um, but but for some breads, it's 5%, some is 10, some is 15. So just even, even if it's whole wheat bread, look to see what the daily value is on foods. And ideally, you want it less than five. They're saying 20% is high. I would say to use 10% as a guide, I would recommend. But, but every product you buy has that. And that is one line to look at. Look at the sodium content and it's, it's, it's takes a little more time shopping, but, but, but read the labels and it gives you very good information and you know what is high or not. Check packages on fresh meats and poultry to see if salt, water or saline has been added. Look at labels on cheese and dairy products. Some are very high in sodium. Ingredients are listed in descending order by law. So whatever is listed first, it has more of. Um, and here is something else important. Here are terms that are used to hide sodium in the food. So sometimes they know people are reading, so they will not say sodium, but they'll say brine or sodium chloride, which is the same thing, or sodium benzoate or sodium nitrite or sodium bicarbonate or MSG or sodium saturin. Do you get a point? So it's under multiple names, so you can find it. But again, if you focus on looking at the sodium content and the DV and try to keep a daily value of 10, percent or less, that would be good. And it's instructive to do this. What can you do? This is a good practical thing. Creative use of seasonings can add flavor without adding salt. So herbs, spices, salt-free seasoning blends, chopped vegetables like garlic, onions, peppers, lemon and lime juice. Um, my wife doesn't want to be put in the spot. She makes some delicious salad dressings at home with lemon and lime juice and other seasonings. So we avoid the, the extra sodium and fat. We're going to talk about fat in a minute that you get from other things. Um, the sodium swap challenge. This is just um, the American Heart Association. It's the same salty six, but they're talking about ways in which you can, in a three week pledge, try to reduce those high salty foods, which you got the six salty six. So this is based on the salty six. The importance of fruits and vegetables. There are other benefits to reducing salt and increasing potassium. Um, this is a study uh, done in the US, higher sodium diet associated with increased mortality. So it's not just blood pressure. If your diet is high in sodium, your risk of death is increased. Higher potassium intake associated with lower overall mortality. But again, because eating more fruits and vegetables, that's healthier for you. Um, so low sodium potassium ratio is a mark of a high intake of plant foods. We have said that. This is just the relationship between all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, 
and adjusted um, the relationship between the sodium uh, potassium ratio, the higher the ratio, the higher um, is deaths from overall death, cardiovascular death, ischemic heart disease death. Summary, keys to reducing sodium intake, eat fresh whenever possible, read nutrition labels, pay attention to portion size, choose reduce or no salt added versions whenever possible, like rely less on convenience foods, avoid salt at the table. Tips to lower salt intake, season with herbs and spices. Eat out less often, because you don't control what you're getting when you eat out. Many have low fat and low sugar choices that are still high in sodium. Be assertive when eating out. Request that salt not be added or other sources or dressings that is normally with that meal that you, they put them on the side so that you control uh, what happens. Um, limit salted snacks. You can get a lot of sodium from salted snacks, chips, crackers, popcorn, nuts, even nuts. Um, limit processed meats, very, very high in sodium. Use small amounts of condiments. Um, here are the top 10 condiments, yellow mustard, relish, vinegar, wasabi, hot sauce, Dijon mustard, mayonnaise, ketchup, barbecue sauce, soy sauce. Read the labels. They're all high in sodium, unless you get a low sodium version. Okay, so I'm giving you the ideas, the suggestions, the things you need to do because you could see with the processing of food, sodium is everywhere. Foods that are natural come from nature is one thing. The processed foods is another thing. Importance of fruits and vegetables. Look at what the government is telling us to reduce not hypertension, cancer risk. People with diets rich in fruits and vegetables have lower risk of getting lung cancer, mouth cancer, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, colon, rectal, breast, pancreatic, larynx, and bladder. This is from the National Cancer Institute. One in three cancer deaths related to dietary factors. Diets low in fat and with five or more servings of fruits and vegetables a day is key. Diet can reduce cancer, getting cancer and dying from cancer. That's rich in cruciferous vegetables as one category. It's very good. Broccoli, cauliflower, lycopene-rich foods, tomato sauce, tomato paste may reduce the risk of prostate cancer. The government used to recommend five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. The National Cancer Institute, that's a federal agency, is now recommending all Americans get nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day to lower your risk of cancer. They are finding that the... Uh, fruits and vegetables have phytochemicals um, that um, they still don't fully understand the mechanisms, but the green, red, yellow, orange, blue, purple, white, all contain a, a unique array of disease fighting phytochemicals that work together with vitamins and minerals to protect your health and lower your cancer risk. This is not a general conference. This is the National Cancer Institute telling you to eat more. These are examples of phytochemicals, carotenoids, lycopene, lutein, flavonoids. You don't have to know the names. Eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. You'll be doing fine. This is from the National Cancer Institute because the average American will say, nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. How am I going to do that? Impossible. And they're showing you how you can get nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Put some in every meal. And they give you examples of what's a fruit and what's a serving of vegetables, okay? So it's possible uh, to get the nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Now, somebody says, I don't want to count servings, it's just too hard. Um, so uh, fill half of your plate with fruits and vegetables. Shrink your use of unhealthy carbohydrates. Focus on whole grains. Dramatically reduce visible fats. Cut back on salt. Limited added sugar. And we can pan out the other... Um, handout now. This is from the government, United States government, saying every time to, you sit down to eat, you want to reduce your risk of cancer, every time you sit down to eat, half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. That, that's what you don't want to count? Look, it's half your plate fruits and vegetables. And then grains, protein, dairy, that's choosemyplate.gov. What I'm handing out is a healthy eating plate. Um, researchers at my school, the Harvard School of Public Health, the Department of Nutrition, said they don't like the government plate. 
So instead, they are recommending, because you see the government plate says grains. They're saying whole grains. You don't want grains, you want whole grains. The government plate says protein. They're saying you want healthy protein. You see? Um, and so they're saying drink water, tea, or coffee. Now we don't need tea or coffee. This is not from the church, so this is their general recommendations. Um, but the general point that they are making of every time you sit down to eat, it's easy. Is half of your plate fruits and vegetables. If you're doing that, you are on the right track. This is the vegetarian plate. This comes from Adventist Health Ministries. Same thing, vegetables, fruit, half the plate, proteins, um, grains. So again, that, this is another practical way you make it real. Look at your plate. Is half your plate fruits and vegetables. Managing blood pressure, improving health, tackling one of the biggest problems in the diet, because let me tell you something else. The DASH diet is just a six-week diet, doesn't do something. Secret. If you lose weight, your blood pressure will also go down. So if you can cut fat in your diet in order to lose weight, that will also lower blood pressure. So limiting fat intake. The body is more efficient storing dietary fat than converting it into stored fat, stored fat into energy. Fat has twice as much calories per gram as carbohydrates and protein. So remember, from fat, we get nine calories per gram. From carbohydrates, four per gram. Protein, four per gram. Not this audience needs this. Alcohol, seven per gram. Foods high in fat provide the least satiety. So it takes more of them to make you feel full. So that's why it's easy for us to overeat on high fat foods. Right, right? You can eat or go through a whole lot of chips very quickly and not feel full. Um, fast foods are a major source of dietary fat. This is really important. I'm gonna show you here the caloric cost of fat. Here is a meal, lettuce and tomato salad, 20 calories, a slice of bread, 70, a good cup of peas, an entree, 150 calories, a baked potato, 100 calories, a glass of skim milk, 80 calories, an apple, 70 calories, total 590 calories. That's a pretty good meal, right? But that's not how we eat it. We add fat. So look at what happens. To the salad, we add salad dressing. A tablespoon of salad dressing is 100 calories. We add some margarine to the bread. We add some margarine or gravy to the beans. We add some gravy to the entree. We add some margarine or sour cream to the potato. We drink, we use a cup of whole milk instead of skim milk. We use a slice of apple pie. Look what we've done. We've gone from 590 calories to 1,330. Okay, but focus and look at the things that have been added. And if you eliminate these or use low fat options, you are dramatically not changing the food. It's not the food that's the problem, it's what we add into the food. Because you can have the food and just look at what you're adding. That's where the problem comes in. And this will help you lose weight, but this is also going to help you with your blood pressure as well. But this is, this is key. Summary, keys to lowering blood pressure. Good nutrition, low salt, high, high potassium, low fat. Regular exercise is also important, reduces peripheral resistance. The studies show the benefit without even regular exercise, but God wants us to exercise, and exercise will help you uh, to do that. Losing weight will also help you avoid smoking. Estrogen found in some birth control pills raises blood pressure, not every pill, but um, read the labels. Avoid alcohol, managing stress. Remember, blood pressure changes with our emotions. So if you're stressed out constantly, even if you're on a high fruit and vegetable diet, you can be pushing your blood pressure up. So managing stress is really important. Medications do not cure hypertension, but I would say don't stop taking them without consulting your doctor. But if you follow the steps I'm talking about, keep your doctor apprised you follow the steps so they monitor your blood pressure. They'll take you off of your medication as they monitor you and they see you making progress. Opportunity for ministry. Look at this information I have just shared. One in two American adults have this problem. 
One in two people. And if you're in a poor community, it's even more. If you're in a minority community, it's even more. What if we develop a program of reaching out to the community on helping them to lower their blood pressure? The World Health Organization asked the question, why treat illness and send people back to live them in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place? I want to share with you, this was a study done back in 1978. Len Syme was a professor of public health at the University of California, Berkeley. But it shows what is possible, and he didn't even do what we are doing. But he just focused on stress reduction in a low-income population, and just reducing stress had a huge impact. Look at what he, what he did. 244 low-income hypertensive patients, 80% of them African-American. What he did, the study, he randomized one-third of them to get routine care. Go to your doctor, get your blood pressure medication, sent on your way home. The second group, health education group, came to a class once a week, a health professional like me, talked to them about blood pressure and why it was important. The third group, he took lay people, no formal training in public health, medicine, nursing, or anything. Lay people from the community, trained them with basic information about blood pressure, but also trained them to identify all the resources that existed in the community to help people with problems. You need rental assistance, this is where you can get help. You need assistance with your energy bill, this is where you can get help. You have problems with your kids, this is where you can get help. They didn't create new programs, they just had lists of all the resources that existed. And what did the outreach group do? They made home visits. They went to the homes of these patients, talked to them about blood pressure, but as necessary, referred them to job opportunities, to where they can get help with financial problems, and, and to solve the problems in their lives. Seven months later, they studied the three groups. The group that had the visits from the outreach, the lay outreach persons, take that, take that means church members from Ipsy Church who went and visited them, they were more likely to have their blood pressure control than the patients in the other two groups. They knew twice as much about blood pressure as patients in the other two groups. They were more compliant, more faithfully taking their blood pressure medication as they were, and among good compliers, blood pressure medication was twice as successful in keeping it nice and low. Why? The high blood pressure problem was understood and addressed within the context of their lives. So they not only got the medication, but they got ways to handle the stress they were dealing with in their life we could develop a program like that of providing information and we didn't create new resources but just linking people to resources that exist okay let me conclude with some general principles of nutrition heavy evening meals poor diet habits no or poor breakfast frequent snacks excessive intake of empty and refined foods those are bad habits um, my nutrition professor at Loma Linda said, eat breakfast as a king, lunch as a prince, supper as a pauper. As he was saying, your biggest meal of your day should be breakfast. You have the rest of the day to burn off those calories. Principles of good nutrition, eat a wide variety of foods. Eat foods and not food products. A lot of what's in the supermarket are food products. Try to focus on eating foods. That is, eat foods as they naturally come from nature. Eat the monk necessary to maintain your ideal weight. Eat at regular times. Start each day with a good breakfast. Okay, here's my professor's <laughs> impact on me. Eat breakfast as a king, lunch as a prince, sup as a pauper. Plan ahead before grocery shopping and only buy what you need. Research finds that if you are hungry when you shop, you buy more junk food. The studies that show that, actually. Buy more junk food if you go shopping when you're hungry. Remember, the more sugar, fat, or salt in the food, the more money is spent on advertisements on television. It's true. Take home lessons. Nutrition plays a major role in all the common chronic diseases. Key principles, more whole grain, more food is grown, more fruits and vegetables. Focus on making changes for the long term. I'm repeating the same thing over and over because I want you to get it. <laughs> because, okay. Um, improving blood pressure. New research points to all truths. 
What did Dr. Sachs say was the key? He looked at populations around the world who were largely following a vegetarian diet of lots of fruits and vegetables. That's man's original diet that the Creator created for us. So believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. The DASH diet is the diet that God created in the beginning. Okay, that's it. Any questions? If I can give just a little bit of instruction. So we're monitoring questions from this audience as well as those who are online and maybe submitting questions in the chat, just so that you're aware. Thank you. Okay, and when you have your, if you can stand, that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Uh, I take some supplements and I was wondering, would a potassium supplement help uh, to lower your blood pressure? As a general rule of thumb, if you are increasing your potassium to sodium ratio in general, that would help to uh, reduce your blood pressure. I don't know why you were taking potassium supplements. I would want to talk to your doctor about that and why that is happening. My recommendation is you could see every food as it naturally comes from nature is high in potassium, low in sodium. So I would go the natural route and not the supplement route, but I don't know the specifics of your case. I would want to talk to your doctor about that. But in general, eat foods as a natural come from nature, solve the problem, and don't get into any, any complications. Yes, Roberta. Regarding the um, my plate? Yes. Where it says the vegetables and the fruits on, um, on each plate, um, I was always thought that we couldn't eat vegetables and fruit together, or should we just separate it? vegetables at one time and fruit at another meal time? Uh, because this says eat it together at the same time. Yes. Um, I think there are statements about um, vegetables and fruits. If you read some of the statements, it's talk about people who have specific problems. Okay. So it's not a general recommendation, even in the spirit of prophecy. Okay. So it is not something that even the church recommends. Got it. So then you say this is a program for six weeks. Uh, so after six weeks, we... we <laughs> no. Okay. So what this program shows that in six weeks, by changing your diet, mm -hmm. you can reduce your blood pressure. If you're going to keep your blood pressure reduced, you, have, you have to, to continue keep, doing it for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life. But it, it shows that the results are evident just in six weeks. You and, can see that. And my last one, I'm not trying to trick you. Into, oh, no, no, into no, no, three, no, three no, 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 that's for, fine. Okay, so if you're taking this low uh, um, uh, blood pressure medication, a very low dose, and then you do this DASH, this DASH diet, are they going to fight against each other? No, no, they're not going to fight against each other. In fact, I would say to you, honestly, if you are now taking prescribed medication, I would not tell you to stop. I would tell you to continue taking it, start the DASH diet, tell your doctor you follow in the DASH diet, and have your doctor monitor your blood pressure maybe more frequently than he, his, he or she historically has, so they can see the progress you're making. And I would let them tell you when to, when to come off of it. Because I don't know how complicated your medical history is and what else is happening. So I wouldn't say just, I, I'm not recommending you just stop taking blood pressure medication, follow the diet, tell your healthcare provider you're doing it, and then let them take you off of it as they monitor the progress you're making. Thank you. Yes. Um, we've always been taught from really young that we need a certain amount of protein in our diet. Now, if we were, for to, if we were to follow what you're advising, it seems as though we'll have to significantly cut down the protein in our diet, or, or are we going to cut down the protein in our diet if we follow some, the elimination of some of these processed, some of these meats as well? And in addition to that, are we compounding an issue if we start to use like meat alternatives? Because some of our plant-based products that are heavily processed and with lots of salt too. So what's the alternative for us and do we have anything to fear? Good question, really good question. To be honest with you, from a nutritional point of view, we do not have a protein problem in the industrialized world. There is not a lack of protein problem. It, it, it doesn't exist. 
everybody is getting adequate protein. Um, if you eat um, the the um, fruits from the plant world that are high in protein are your beans and nuts. Legumes, beans, peas, beans, nuts are high protein foods. So that um, for a, a typical vegetarian, there is no problem of protein intake. Uh, the, the problem in our, we in, in our contemporary society are eating too much protein because a lot of the foods that we think of as high protein foods have more fat than protein. So we get in a lot of fat plus the protein. Um, but there isn't, there is no protein crisis in the world. So if you follow this, there is no protein crisis, absolutely. Because you get these foods, all foods have a little protein, the high protein foods are your nuts and legumes and, and those are there, they provide adequate proteins. The point you are making though about the um, vegetarian substitute products, the same rule that I applied needs to apply to them. And honestly, I have not rigorously, it's a good thing. I'm going to look at it. You can, you can, I will go, next time I go to the supermarket, I'm gonna look at all of the Morningstar uh, brands. My supermarket has a lot of them and look to see what is their salt intake. My guess, my guess is that they have high salt added, but I haven't checked. So the, the rule that I'm giving you apply to everything. Um, and again, I would not say we should never use them. I think they are most helpful. We don't need them for protein. We do not need them for protein. What they are good for is convenience. That you can quickly put something in a microwave and a minute later, you have something to eat. That's it, the it, convenience is what they offer us. It's, we do not need them for protein. So it's convenience. So I would say the same rule I applied to all other products, Look at the labels there as, as well and look at the sodium content, but it's a very good question. Yes. And then in front. First of all, I want to say how much I appreciate this uh, presentation. Having worked in healthcare, I can tell you the vast majority of my patients, African American, we are having a number of challenges controlling blood pressure. I have patients on five medications. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they live in facilities where they have no control over their meals. So they have to eat what's before them. So one yeah. initiative we're doing at a practice that I'm working at is try to co uh, collaborate with their food service department right. to put no salt or low, no added salt or low salt diets mm -hmm. out there because we are finding it, it, they immediately, not only the high blood pressure, next problem is the kidney function. Sure. Absolutely. Um, the other thing I would say is we do tend to be a little more liberal with our patients over 60 with higher blood pressures. I think right now the JNC8 guidelines are around 150 over 90. If you don't have kidney problems or heart uh, issues, because what we find if we lower it too much, when they stand up, they get dizzy and we're seeing a lot of falls with lower blood pressure. So that's something you might want to uh, collaborate with your physician on, but we do tend to uh, allow for a little more liberal, uh, higher numbers for some of our elderly patients because they don't drink a lot of water. They're dehydrated most of the time. They're on a numerous medications and we just see them falling all the time because their blood pressures are right around 120 or 115, which looks great for a person who's had a heart attack. But for an 85 year old grandma, who doesn't drink a lot of water, she stands up, she's dizzy, and next thing you know, she goes boom. Let, let's so, get grandma drinking water. But <laughs> yeah, no. you follow me. Yes. So, you know, that's something we you can collaborate yes. with your physician yes. about. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a good point. Um, but the the uh, and your point is is real, but one way to get them is to get people hydrated and and to minimize that that problem. I think Opal who worked as a Current intensive care nurse wanted to jump in on this. Well, I, I think you covered it well. I was just going to say with all the static blood pressure, which occurs many times, you see it with the elderly, and you 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 covered it pretty much. Um, many times it could be due to dehydration as well, and not the problem with. The... So hydration is key for uh, especially the elderly, but it's key for all of us. Most of us don't get enough water, so that's one of the eight laws of health. 
is adequate hydration. Yes. I have um, a comment from the chat. If following the DASH diet to lower blood pressure, shouldn't one also include 30 to 40 minutes of daily exercise to complement this goal? I think this is an important point that should be made, especially related to resistance and aerobic activity. I completely, totally agree. The point I am making is the DASH diet alone produced these reductions in blood pressure. That was the study. The DASH diet did not test exercise. So even without exercise, the DASH diet with, with low salt is more effective than antihypertensive medication. So that's a take home message. But yes, we are talking about the eight laws of health. We do them all. That's why I talked about fat, reducing fat intake uh, helps us. And so absolutely exercise would help us maintain our weight. It's another strategy to lower in blood pressure, but I'm showing you that science shows just the diet alone does it. But if we are taking a comprehensive holistic look, yes, we want to get our rest. We want all of the new start principles are important. And yes, blood exercise is important, not only for lowering blood pressure in general, but helping us to maintain weight. So absolutely. Good question. I'm glad you raised that because it's a good point to emphasize. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I don't know if this is a myth or is it something made of. How much more susceptible are we as a uh, to high blood pressure? I hear that all the time. Good question. So, uh, and I can answer that from scientific studies. Please. Black people in America is the group, some studies show Native Americans very high as well, that have very high levels of blood pressure. Um, many um, physicians historically have thought there's an African gene that is responsible for it. And when researchers, there's a study done by Richard Cooper, um, he was at Loyola Medical School, cardiologist, and he studied black people in rural Africa, in urban Africa, black people in the, in the Caribbean of African descent in, in three Caribbean islands and in the US and compare it to white people Guess what? White people in America have higher levels of hypertension than blacks in Africa. And blacks in rural Africa who have traditional diets have markedly lower levels of blood pressure than blacks in urban Africa who are becoming more westernized like we are. So it has nothing to do with your race. It has to do with where you are and what are the dietary patterns. So whites in America have higher levels of hypertension than black people in Africa. So it's not about race, it's about context, diet, lifestyle, stress, all the problems that we deal with. Okay, and my other part of my question is in relation to the medications. But, but, but the point, let me, let me just emphasize the point because it's an important point. So that when we talk, remember I said it this morning, you in any audience of black people, at least one in two so when we deal with a hypertension problem, it's more common in blacks in America. Yes. So when we think of the communities we serve and we are most connected to, if we focus a program on hypertension, you are reaching one in two people. So, so, so that stat, which is not genetic, um, is an important one for us to keep in mind as we think of programming. Yes. Right. And I was all gonna say economically, I guess, in the past blacks, susceptibility to high blood pressure, possibly because of uh, economics, mm -hmm. uh, could contribute to that because yes. of the food Absolutely. we had Which to buy. Like, yes. um, and, and the other last question I have is in regards to the medications that are put at, uh, that are given to us in regards to those who have high blood pressure the statins or the metformins and all these things which supposedly raise or do whatever they're supposed to do, such as statins. I have no idea what they do, but you see the common medication push that high blood pressure normally. And these are the things the doctors will say, you gotta take this, you gotta do this. And one of the other factors you made earlier today is that we as black men are very, very leery or skeptical about taking so many different medicines. There is, I'll tell you two things that you, your question reminds me of. There is some studies, not all of them, but there are studies that have found in general with increasing socioeconomic status, yes. you have better health. So college educated, 
have better health of almost any health problem. There have been some studies that find among African American men positive relationship. The highest blood pressure is among the highest um, educated, hmm. which we think reflects the stress they are under, oh, including okay. the stress of discrimination. Yes. So um, you, you had well, meant another point there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, the different, there is, it was also widely viewed and, and physicians in medical school were taught that blacks responded, you knew a patient's race and it told you which type of, me, of antihypertensive medication you, you should use. That blacks responded to these and whites responded to cancel channel blockers and, and beta, which ones, but you could tell a patient which, which patients respond better to diuretics. There have been now careful studies uh, done on these. Blacks and whites have the, I, for most of the antihypertensive medications, blacks and 88% of blacks and whites respond exactly the same way. So there's the, the, the widely held view that race is a good predictor of which type of medication to use is not supported by the latest science that have looked at different medications and blacks and whites and so on. But the, the key, I think, is take these protective, healthy strategies, let your provider know you're doing them and let them reduce your blood pressure medication. They might begin by reducing and then ultimately eliminating if you make progress, if you're keeping your blood pressure nice and low. But, Bob's. Uh, thank, thank you, David. It's good to be in the house of the Lord and especially the things that I've been through in the last five years. Uh, high blood pressure has been my problem, and um, so bad that I have now, I'm on blood pressure medicine and back and forth because of the eight laws of health um, and the stress of being a bus driver. They respond, they require a higher level of controlled blood pressure in the, those kind of occupations. So with that, I have learned how to adjust back and forth and trying to get back into the, the 10 laws of health. I understand that there's eight laws of health that we're mostly common to, but my question is, what is the other two and how will that relate to us as lay people and Christians? What are the other two laws that you're talking about? I'm not sure what you're referring to, Fred. According to Ellen G. White, there's other, there are two more laws. Which are? Um, I forgot the names, and that's why I'm asking a question. I'm not can sure. Anyone, can anyone help me on that? I, I do not know. Say again. Benevolence and gratitude. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, OK, there, is, there are scientific studies that show if you're more kind, if you're more gratitude, you, it improves your health. There, if you just keep, there are studies now uh, in managing stress and improving mental health that will just have you keep, uh, and these are not yeah. religious people, Keep a gratitude journal. Every day, write down five things you're thankful for. If you just do that every day, it improves your mental health. So, yes. Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. <laughs> so being thankful for what we have is, is a health-enhancing strategy. So, yes. And being kind to others. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. No, I'm just saying, I think this is a outstanding topic, particularly for African Americans and for men. Yes. And you know, for me, again, I spent 10 years in cardiac surgery. So I've seen all the ill effects. And, and, and what you're saying is absolutely correct. There really isn't any major differences. Every yes. we all respond pretty much yes. the same way. Yes. And what I want to say also is particularly with with pressure. I think that is very important for us as a people to know more about options. You now this, you know, the diets, this will reduce our risk. Mm -hmm. But for those who may have been taking too long to get to this point, you know, a lot of times we are un uninformed of various things that will benefit us. For example, we're the, we're the highest number, we have the highest rates of amputations mm -hmm. because they don't tell us what our options are. Mm -hmm. They basically say, well, just cut it off. Mm -hmm. Where everyone else, they'll, they'll give you options. So I'm just saying the bottom line is, is that we have to be informed we have to be, you know, we have to really make a concerted effort. This is the information age. 
there's no reason why we're not getting the I, necessary information. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I think it is so true in so many cases. The cases you e e exampled of um, blacks going into healthcare. I served on the Unequal Treatment Report Committee that released in 2003 from the National Academy of Medicine. Across virtually every therapeutic intervention, blacks receive poorer quality care. I have just collaborated with some colleagues at Henry Ford um, and the University of Michigan um, uh, Department of Gynecology. Um, and we are proposing to do the largest study ever done of fibroids in black and white women in the United States. Most black women get fibroids um, by the age of 40. Um, and the typical approach is to remove the uterus in black women and where other options are offered to white women. So it's, uh, it, it, so I'm just saying this, it's another example and I only thought of it because I've thought a lot about fibroids in the last four months. I've been working on this proposal with these colleagues. Hopefully we get funded to do it. Um, that would really shed light on on how we can address the issue of fibroids much better because it's another area of dramatic black white differences in what the provider offers the women but yes it, it's it's across many areas of medicine i have um kathy shaw says hello david <laughs> <laughs> um her question has to do with using beets or beet powder for the lowering of blood pressure can you comment um I honestly know of no evidence that that I don't know of any evidence of using beets specifically um, to lower blood pressure. I think beets is a healthy food. So in the context of other healthy foods, I think it's a good thing to use. I am not aware, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I don't know everything, but when I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> I think I saw Sister Barbara at the back. Hi, Sister Barbara. Oh, okay. <laughs> My friend here is first. Okay. Okay. All right, Sister Babbitt. <laughs> I just wanted to <clears throat> mention that sodium. We talk about sodium quite a bit, but there's different phases in sodium. It's a compilation on how it's done that makes a difference. And we we need, as with the eight laws of health, need to do a little more research on what type of sodium we should use in our foods. If we're going to add uh, above what nature has already given us. Okay, good point. I, I had a list of the many different terms uh, that that sodium is used on in the food. Um, I, I, I agree with you. There are different forms, but I, I, I would want to emphasize, folks. The take-home point is: read that label and look to see the percentage. I, I don't care what form it is. If it's higher than ten, I think it's too high for maintaining blood pressure nice and low. Yes. This is more a question of curiosity. I, okay. I want to see if there's any science behind this. My wife suffered from high blood pressure for a long time. Mm -hmm. After she got dementia, I started to give her what I call an immune booster, made up of ginger, turmeric, garlic, and lime. And for the last six months, she hadn't had to take her blood pressure. And her doctor knows that. And I am, uh, I am, I am, I am attributing the lower in the blood pressure to what I did in terms of that. But I don't know if that is necessarily true. But she doesn't. I, I don't know. Um, Mark is coming to my rescue. <laughs> No, 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 I didn't know if you had some information. I, I, I do not know. I would look at what the sodium potassium ratio is of the what you have given her. Has there been other dietary changes yeah. in, you know, I, I don't know. So, yes, so it could be, it could be his wife has been a vegetarian and the salt she gets, so he hasn't put any extra salt. So I, I don't know if she's, if this has given her a high potassium dose, for example, I, I, I don't know. Um, I would want to look more at what, what are the specifics. No, yeah. they, you know, like you said, all of these have benefits, you know, just to kind of address the whole beat thing. 
Beets are natural. They, they, they have a natural kind of a nitric oxide. They're very high in nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. Mm -hmm. So that's so it facilitates, but it works congruently with that whole potassium sure. okay. sodium mm -hmm. uh, 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 matrix mm -hmm. that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's the benefit of, a, of beets, beets and beet juice mm -hmm. is that because of the nitric oxide within it will drop your pressure within hours. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you. You see, I need help here. My able assistant. You were in my Sabbath school class at one point, weren't you? I think so, <laughs> if I remember correctly. He's my colleague today, but you know, we go way back. <laughs> okay. Hi, Sister Josephine. Hi, I have a question for you. Yes. Two questions. One, first of all, uh, I'd want to say thank you for coming. And also on behalf of the University of Michigan, a number of you are watching online now. Uh, and also, um, the question that I have for many of our seniors, you know, people are living longer now, and the Social Security was up to, what, 70 years of age, I believe, and many of them are not getting their uh, Social Security, and they have to make a choice of whether they're going to pay for their medication or pay their rent. Many of them that have paid their rent have died because they couldn't get their medication. So one of the things that we've done here in Washington County is provided uh, the generic brand. Okay. And my question to you is, oftentimes in working with the various seniors, the generic brand is causing them to have other health issues. So what do you recommend? Um, I don't know enough about the challenge to really speak um, authoritatively. Um, generally speaking, generic brands have the same key ingredient. So the generic brand per se is not a problem, but there may be other, unless it has something else that is interacting with something else. But generically, but basically, I don't think the generic brand itself is, is a fundamental problem, but I don't know enough to talk about it. I don't know if someone else does, I would appreciate it. Yes. Yes. Mark. Hi. Hi, sorry. My question is, um, I was told the Himalayan salt is much better for you because the pink salt, um, they have minerals and different things like that. It's black salt, pink salt, and um, Redmond salt. What is, are those salts a little bit better to use? Because I switched those out um, because they have the mineral effect and, or should I just not use them at all? I, again, don't know the details of the salt. If someone knows, tell me. Um, again, what I would focus on is what's the sodium content. Um, but is, is it, does it have lower sodium content than the traditional sodium chloride? I, 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 that, that's what I would want to know. Um, I don't know. But again, let's read the labels, look at the percentage. I think that might guide us. But if someone knows some more. Well, I, yes. just w related to Celtic salt and Himalayan salt, they contain more minerals. Okay. So they're a, they're a healthier salt mm -hmm. to use. Okay. And you usually don't have to use as much. Okay. And they have the mineral content, the, bro okay. the breadth so the of the mineral content minerals. is better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So for those of us to just eat two meals a day, mm -hmm. they still eat vegetables in the morning too? Fruits and vegetables. In the morning. Yes. Sure. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. It's it's a daily amount is being uh, recommended. Um, I think we have two minutes, right? Yes. Yes, Pam. Welcome home, David. Thank you. A um, couple of questions, um, Doctor. Are you familiar with Doctor Stephen Gundry? Yes, so he, I'm not very familiar with all the details of his work, but I, I know who, yeah. Well, he's growing in popularity secularly mm -hmm. to the extent that a lot of persons who don't profess any belief in anything are subscribing to what he proposes. And he takes the good things about eating more fruits and vegetables to a higher level. Two things that he mentions that are, I just wanna get your take on are specifically related to fruit. He says that we should eat green, more green bananas because the yellow ones are like a sugar bomb and they would send our blood pressure in orbit. He also says that for some of the fruits that we would eat, like the difference in apples, 
he said the Honeycrisp apple is more has more sugar than the green apple. So I'm just wondering your take on it, it. It's not that he's saying these aren't good. He's saying choose better because of the consequences of choosing other. So, but he's also selling a product. Right? That, no, no, I, I, I've watched one of his videos and he's selling a product that has these things that he got from here and there and, and got this in this product. To be honest with you, I think the points he's making, there may be some element of truth to them, but honestly, I honestly think they are at the margins for most people. This is the take home point. Eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Don't eat the same fruits and, and you have these two fruits and, and you eat exactly the same thing every day. It's, the more you can spread it out and even the variety of apples and, and grapes and pears and so on, because they, they do vary. He is correct. Different. Every apple is not identical and they don't have the same amount of, this, of every nutrient. And the, to the extent that you get a wide variety of different fruits and vegetables, you are trading off the benefits of one versus another, what one is strong on the other is. So that would be the general point. And I don't think there's a big issue like that disastrous for your health if you eat this product, but um, that there's some foods within the same family that some varieties that have more certain nutrients than others, absolutely that's true. But the key take home message is, eat a wide variety of different fruits and vegetables, you'll be fine. That's a perfect point on which we can end. Yes. I want to thank you because we actually have a hard stop right now yes. because of the technology that we need to do in preparation for the four o'clock presentation. Yes. So I want to thank, thank you, Dr. Williams, <laughs> for your presentation and your Remember, information. At, at Ipsy, everybody calls me Brother David. Right, okay, Brother, Brother Williams, David. Brother David. Yeah, after we drop this stuff, foot it across, <laughs> ground is level, we drop all this stuff. Okay. So for everyone, you want to stand up and stretch. We actually have out in the lobby, if there's a, a, a gallon jug of water um, and cups, and there's some fruit, if you want to take it, obviously we don't want you to eat it inside the sanctuary. But if you want to just um, kind of get your um, 